I see myself as a very analytical person. I like to break down a problem into little pieces and work them out until there's a solution. Fix this thing part over here, see how that affects this part, and then if that doesn't work, go back and try again. My favorite parts about my job are hearing the phrase, oh, that'll never work, <laughs> and then solving the problem anyway. But not all problems can or should be solved analytically. Three months prior to my daughter's birth, I felt some major abdominal cramping. My wife knew it must have been important when she suggested going to the doctor, and I agreed. Because she took me directly to the emergency room. My appendix had perforated. It was scary, but I knew I was in good hands, and I was back to work a couple days later. While at the hospital, the admissions nurse asked me about my family medical history. I'm adopted, I told her. I know next to nothing about my family medical history. It was a SEAL adoption, so I know next to nothing about my birth parents. My history is a mystery. Roll the dice, I joked. The nurse commented about how genetic testing is getting cheaper and more reliable every day. And working in healthcare, this isn't something that's lost on me. There are a few pillars to understanding a patient's diagnosis. The biggest are the patient's symptoms and their family medical history. And when done thoroughly and based on research, medical screenings are getting better at identifying the risk factors. It seems reasonable for me to get one. It would, be selfish of me, it would be selfish of me not to. But I have some hesitations. When I was a kid, my father worked as the CFO of a computer manufacturing company. I didn't get to see it much as a kid, but his office was straight out of Mad Men, with the cart, the whiskey bottles, the ice buckets. Those were for his guests. My dad was a beer guy. And being true to the stereotype, my dad, the Porsche driving CFO, married a secretary, my mom. <laughs> she became a stay-at-home mom, member of the PTA, and volunteered as the head of a craft group to, that raised money for the local hospital. I was adopted into the family at seven months old and was an only child until my sister was adopted seven years later. Growing up, we regularly went on family vacations. We toured the country in a motorhome, visited the Grand Canyon, visited other national monuments and parks. My father was happiest when we would go up to Mammoth and go camping for a few days. He did a lot of relaxing. And by relaxing, I mean fishing. He was our Boy Scout troop leader, which I think was just another excuse to go camping. In his 30s, he founded the SoCal Porsche Club. He loved planning and competing on the monthly uh, Porsche rallies that they did, sometimes with as many as 60 other cars. These rallies were timed races with logic puzzles instead of on sheets of paper instead of maps. And when I was old enough, I got to play the role of the navigator. Always stressful, but lots of fun. That's probably where I got my love for puzzle rooms and analytical problem solving. We were the typical upper middle class family. I was too young to understand it at the time, but when I was five years old, something happened that created a shift in my father's outlook on life. My father's dad passed away from heart failure when he was in his mid-60s. A few years later, his mom passed away, also of a heart attack. I was young, but I remember flying out to visit my dad's parents on their apple orchard on the Illinois border. We took long walks through, my, uh, through, the, through their orchard, my grandfather picking trees down, pulling out his pocket knife, and carving off slices for me to sample. But now both of my, parents father, both of my father's parents are gone. And starting at about 12 years old, funerals became known to me as family reunions. My father was the youngest of four brothers. One by one, each of his brothers passed away, 
all of them before they were 60, and all of them of heart failure. My father was eight years younger than his closest sibling, and he saw the writing on the wall. As each brother died, I watched him become more and more consumed with his own inevitable soon pending death. His feeling that time was running out led him to make some unhealthy decisions. Out of an obsession to grow the company that he loved so much, and he worked very quickly to grow that company larger than it was intended to be, or even ready to be. When the company was taken over in a merger, he lost his job, and he never sought another job after this. Our family vacations all but ceased, and he wasn't enjoying them when we did go. He did little more than handyman work for our church and our neighbors. None of this was helped by my mom's long journey through many stages of cancer until she died at her home a few years later. It was really weird watching my dad go through this metamorphosis from someone who truly loved and lived life to someone who was anchored to his life with this fear of his impending death. Everything he did seemed to be planned around this. He kept a rugged gray file box made of plastic with a thick black handle. And in that box, he contained all of his bank investment papers, his will, insurance papers, everything, ready for him to go. Practically every visit my sister and I had with him, he made sure we knew where he kept it, you know, for when he died. Way to make visiting you awkward, Dad. So you've all heard about foreshadowing, right? <laughs> about seven years ago, my dad died, wait for it, from a heart attack. You might think I was emotionally prepared for his passing. I mean, he brought it up all the time. No. I was in a lot of denial about this, and I was sure he was overreacting. He ate healthy, got plenty of exercise, but his death hit me pretty hard, and my sister even harder. But we have a supportive family, and we got through it. I have my own family now. I have a wife and a daughter to go on camping trips and crazy road trips, like this past summer when we went through Idaho to see the eclipse. And you always hope that your child finds something to be passionate about for themselves. For my daughter, that's figure skating. It could be five in the morning, and she will be waking us up, demanding that someone take her to the rink so she can go practice her routine or her next jump that she's working on with her coaches. And nothing makes me weep those giant proud dad tears, like watching her compete with her eyes smiling so bright you're afraid she's going to melt the ice. There's also my wife, an amazing copywriter and a luthier who can build guitars that look like they belong in fairy tales, all while being a nurturing mother to our daughter and a loving wife to me. She comes from a close family who know their family lineage for well over a century back. I love my family and they mean the world to me. I want to make the best life for them. This leaves me in a situation where I'm torn. Would knowing my family's, or would knowing my medical history benefit them? What if I have a medical condition that I need to prepare for now? What if I have a condition that I've passed on to my daughter? I probably don't, but you don't watch everyone in your father's family side pass away before they're 65 without getting a little bit anxious about your own mortality. With seeing how my father handled his, it leaves me troubled. Do I go and get a genetic test done? I don't think I want to. But it also worries that that's selfish of me. Is knowing powerful or is it crushing? My wife knows my concerns and has quietly scoured the archives and online forums for any information about my birth parents, and we've discussed what finding out means to me and our family, and how it benefits or hinders our lives. To look at it in pieces, 
How do the varying outcomes change who I am? If the results show something dire, do I, like my father, live life less? Or if I'm given a clean outlook, does that change who I am? Do I remain the same husband and father that I am right now? I don't know. And that's what keeps me up at night.